So let's begin with an overview of the Biodata Catalyst ecosystem. The first thing that we like to explain is how Terra um, and how cloud-based uh, computation differs from the traditional approach. Um, in the traditional approach to bioinformatic research, um, the data has to be kind of copied uh, by every individual researcher, um, which is very inconvenient because it uh, creates a large proliferation of uh, data storage. And of course, there are also a lot of attendant uh, versioning issues. In the cloud-based approach, we have a central place where all of the data and the tools live. And uh, so long as we can provide a secure way for researchers to access that cloud-centric uh, 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 repository, then uh, everybody can be on the same page in terms of both the security and the versions of the data and the tools that they're using. So to that end, uh, we've uh, created this um, uh, service called Terra. And Terra is basically a portal that uh, hosts data and tools in order to uh, create a um, location where you can do your analysis securely on the cloud. So Terra hosts um, a set of uh, data repositories, for example, Gen3 and Picture. Um, and these are uh, integrated into Terra in such a way that enables faceted search for authorized users. Uh, authorized users can then create and export cohorts to workspaces that also live within Terra. Um, and this creates a reproducible and secure way uh, for them to share that data. And the same thing can be said of the tools that are integrated into Terra. So there are a lot of Dockerized uh, workflows. Um, and if you're not familiar with Docker, it's a uh, system by which you can uh, uh, keep track of what version of which tools uh, you're using. Um, and so everything is uh, saved and versioned in a way that uh, is very shareable so that you always know that you are uh, using the exact same tool and the exact same version of the same tool as uh, whoever you're working with. Um, I'm sorry, and in addition to uh, the workflow-based tools, there are also uh, uh, downstream analysis tools such as Jupyter Notebooks, and you'll see how we use Jupyter Notebooks uh, at the end of this webinar as well. Uh, and so we put all of these things together uh, in order to be able to create the analysis in a secure and collaborative place within the cloud. Um, and everyone who uh, is authorized to look at a particular set of data or use a particular set of tools can then both look at that analysis uh, together or they can recreate that analysis. Um, and in this way, we uh, uh, hopefully facilitate uh, a lot of collaboration. Um, and of course, all of this is uh, uh, inside of the FISMA and FedRAMP uh, moderate perimeter. So uh, everything is based on uh, a very tight set of authorizations for um, security purposes. So uh, uh, just to explain uh, the levels of the ecosystem, uh, Biodata Catalyst is uh, built on data in the cloud. And this includes repositories like Gen3 and Picture. Next is the uh, system for ensuring security for controlled access data. And uh, then there's an interface for finding and selecting the data that you need for your study. Um, at the top are the platforms for analyzing the data and collaborating with your colleagues. So uh, this is a screenshot of the landing page of the Terra Analysis platform. You'll be seeing this in just a moment when we begin our platform tour. Um, and just before we go to the uh, uh, platform tour, I want to uh, show you some of the resources that are available to you to learn more about on your own time. But go ahead and open that link uh, when you're ready to join me on the tour. We'll come back to the link in a moment so that everyone can see it. But before we do, I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that there are a lot of resources to help guide you in uh, using Biodata Catalyst and Terra. So we have our own 
uh, uh, a set of documentation and tutorials for Terra, um, as well as Gen3 and DocStore. And you should be uh, able to access them uh, through links in this slide deck, which will be shared with you. There's a YouTube channel uh, all about using Terra in which you can learn all sorts of tips and tricks. Um, and uh, it's very convenient to be able to kind of go back and forth in the movie uh, just, to, just to see exactly how everything is done step by step. Uh, and finally, and you'll see this again in the uh, live platform tour momentarily, but inside of the uh, Terra application, there is also a set of uh, showcase and tutorials workspaces that help get you acclimated to basically any function within Terra that you could be interested in. Um, and also, finally, there is a whole set of uh, uh, technical support documentation for Terra that um, you can find uh, linked from the Terra interface. I'll, I'll show you exactly where that is. Uh, but we have a lot of very detailed um, documentation and a lot of uh, tutorials uh, written out step by step with graphics and GIFs and everything you could possibly imagine. So with that, let's go ahead and go to our live platform tour. So if you, um, if you don't have a link, or we can add the link to the chat, but if you want to just type it out, the URL is terra.biodatacatalyst.nhibi.nih.gov. Um, and incidentally, if you go to our documentation, um, you'll find that a lot of stuff apply, uh, uh, points to the URL app.terra.bio, which is literally the exact same stuff. Um, I'm going to go to the landing page of uh, Terra by clicking on this logo in the top left, just to the right of the um, this uh, main menu button. I'm going to click right here. I'm going to click it twice as soon as it lets me. So if you click this enough times, then you go all the way to the top, to the landing page. Um, and again, if I were to go to app.terra.bio, you would see the exact same interface uh, branded in a different way. So when you go to the documentation, if you want to learn anything and you see that it looks slightly different, um, everything applies to this interface as well. So with that all being said, I'll get started on our live platform tour. So this is our landing page. And if you click on this main menu icon at the top left, you will see the main menu pop up on the left. And the first thing we'll take a look at is what you can find under your own name. So here uh, you can go to your profile. Um, your profile contains uh, some uh, uh, important information. Um, about your uh, proxy group. It also contains um, links to external servers. So we will actually need to uh, uh, log into our NHLBI um, Biodata Catalyst Framework services. Um, and I, I'm actually going to go ahead and do that right now. Um, you'll see that for me, it says re renew. Um, actually, I'll, I'll click unlink so that you can see what it will look like for you. So now it says log in to link to your account. Before you click on this link, you do have to go to the Gen3 website. So um, if someone could kindly put this link into the chat um, to let everyone do this. And Ali will show you how to do this as well in case you're um, just watching right now, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. So you go to this URL, you click log in, and um, I'm going to use this login, but you will log in through NIH. So once I'm logged in, I should be able to go back to my profile and click authorize. And now 
my Terra account is linked to my NHLVI Biodata Catalyst Framework Services. So under your name, you'll also find a page for uh, the various authorization domain groups that you have access to. Um, authorization domains are an added security feature that uh, we won't be going all over uh, in this webinar in particular details. However, they are highly recommended for you to use if you're um, working with any type of access limited data. Um, so uh, in the group management section here is where you can create your own group and then you can um, add other users to your authorization domain. This is also where you would uh, see what groups you are a member of. Um, <clears throat> under your name, you can also find the list of billing projects that you have access to, uh, as well as add a billing project using that button. Um, under your name, you can also access very, uh, uh, the number of uh, cloud environments that uh, you have running. And the cloud environments uh, are uh, related to the Jupyter Notebooks. So this is something we'll go over towards the end of the webinar. You can see here what cloud environments you have in existence. You can see if there are any that um, have errored out for any reason. Um, this is also a convenient place where uh, you can get rid of them. So for example, I'll go ahead and just delete this cloud environment. Um, and this is also a place where you can uh, do the same thing with persistent disks that uh, are attached to your cloud environments. And we'll talk a little bit more about persistent disks later on. So before we go uh, over to workspaces, I want to show you uh, uh, what you can find in Terra's data library and uh, the showcase and tutorial section and the workflows section. Uh, and we'll also talk about uh, the various uh, types of support that you can find linked to from the interface. I'll start by going to the library. And here in the library, uh, you can find three sections uh, in these three tabs, and you'll notice that uh, you see the exact same options in these three tabs as uh, you do if you just click on the library section. So these would take you to these um, three tabs within the library. Um, in the leftmost tab are data sets um, that you can explore. Uh, so this is where you uh, might go if you are looking for uh, various data sets of interest. Um, the showcase and tutorial section is where you'll find a variety of uh, workspaces that have all been uh, pre-configured to uh, run on various topics. So we have, for example, uh, our new and interesting section here on the left. Most of these workspaces are uh, COVID-related workspaces. Um, on the right, we have uh, all of our GATK4 workflows pre-configured to their uh, best practices configurations. And here in featured workspaces in the middle, you can find uh, really a very wide variety of workspaces to get you acclimated to uh, a, a whole slew of different things that you can get done on Terra. One very useful workspace that might be interesting to this cohort is the Biodata Catalyst Collections. We saw it, but you scrolled by it, Anton. There so. it is. Yeah. However, that is not the one that we'll be working with in this webinar. So uh, before we go and find the one we'll be working in with the webinar, I'll just point out that uh, in the library here, you can also find uh, code and workflows. So you can select individual workflows um, and send them to whatever workspace you're working with. Um, in addition to these um, GATK4 best practice workflows that are right on the front, you can also find additional ones in the doc store, in the Broad Methods repository. Um, and yeah, you can just send them. 
So you can look at the workspace or at the workflow and you can export it to whatever workspace you're interested in. So lastly, we'll go to our workspaces tab. And um, this is a uh, section of the interface where you can find all of the workspaces that you have access to. So for example, here are all of the workspaces um, uh, uh, listed under my workspaces. You can also go to the new and interesting and featured workspaces um, that I showed you in the library section. And you can see actually all public workspaces. So public workspaces are um, not necessarily exposed in the data library, but they are available to the public. So as soon as you have a login, you can uh, find that workspace and clone your own copy of it, which is exactly what we're going to do now. So hopefully you've been following along with me because this is the part um, that we're all going to do together. So I'm going to just type in the word webinar. Actually, don't need to even type in the whole word. But uh, if I type in the word webinar and I am looking at specifically the public section of the workspaces, then the only uh, result is the Biodata Catalyst onboarding webinar. And that's the workspace that we will be working with. So I'm going to click on that. And we're going to go ahead and clone this workspace right now. So before I do that, I'll just point out that um, you can see that this is a read-only copy, um, so you wouldn't able you wouldn't be able to necessarily uh, do things like um, launch workflows or launch a cloud environment. Uh, I am able to because I happen to be uh, on the list for this particular workspace. So if I were to click the share button, you could see um, I'm listed as a writer on this particular workspace. Um, although you should not be able to do anything in this version of the workspace. So if you want to, you should go ahead and clone your own copy. And another thing I'll point out just before we do that is if you take a look at the list of owners over here, uh, this is where your name will be listed after you've um, clicked copy. So make sure that you uh, give the workspace a unique name. So I'm just going to call it March 16th. Um, and when we say that it has to have a unique name, um, we mean that it has to have a unique name per billing project. So um, if you were using the exact same billing project as I was, or um, if other people are, then it's important to add something unique to yourself. So for example, I'll add my initials there. Um, and then uh, again, just briefly to point out where you would set an authorization domain. We won't actually do it right now, but in general, when you are uh, working with controlled access data, um, you should set an authorization domain. It's important to set the authorization domain when you initially create the workspace, when you hit clone, because um, you can't do it uh, afterwards. You can't uh, go back into a workspace that you've already created and protect it. Um, you have to do that as you're cloning it. So Angela, can I interrupt and add um, some more uh, tips when it comes to authorization domains? So this is Alisa. I would suggest that um, if you are creating a workspace that you would expect to share with people in the future, you should um, consider what authorization domain uh, that you would set up for that workspace and, and try to maintain the workspaces under the correct um, bubble of authorization authorization domain that you'd want to use. Otherwise, in the future, if there's another configuration of access that you'd like to use, um, you'd probably just have to create a new workspace or clone a workspace. Uh, well, you'd have to create a new workspace under a new authorization domain with sets of people in that authorization domain. So just think carefully about what the purpose of a workspace is. And if you do want to share it, if you want to share it under an authorization domain, who is going to be in that authorization domain? Thank you. So I'll go ahead and click clone workspace. 
and you'll notice now um, that the workspace, actually you can't really see it because um, the workspace name is so long, but if the workspace name were much shorter, you would see at the end here that uh, it has the unique name that you gave it. Um, so I guess I could have written the unique part of the name at the beginning so that you could see that it would say, then it would say March 16th right over here. You'll notice that um, I am now listed as the owner of this workspace. There's a bunch of uh, workspace information over here. You can see that uh, uh, you can see when it was created, aka right now. Um, this is also where you can uh, uh, see the Google bucket address for this workspace. So each workspace comes with its own dedicated Google bucket. Um, and there's a nice convenient button for copying the uh, address of that Google bucket right here. Um, and you can also uh, uh, open it uh, in your browser using this link. Once you've cloned it, you should be able to uh, hit the share button. So again, when I hit this share button before, I was able to access it because I was already listed as a writer with the can share uh, checkbox checked for me. So I was able to share it. But if you tried it on the public read only version, then that button would have been grayed out for you. Uh, whereas now that you've cloned your own copy, you're able to share this with whoever you like. So you would write in a, a person's email. Uh, you could also write in an authorization domain group uh, to share it, to share the workspace with. Um, and when you do that, it gives you a, a whole bunch of options about how much access to give the person that you're sharing with. So you you can give them reader access, you can give them writer access, you can give them owner access, which will allow them to do uh, absolutely anything. Um, and then there's a little bit more granular control here. So you can give them can share and can compute access. Um, obviously, that won't um, that won't necessarily work um, for every level of access. So for example, if you only share reader level access with someone, you can give them the right to share the workspace with others. Um, so they'll be able to uh, copy the, the code, but they won't necessarily be able to uh, launch computation because they don't have access to that billing project. Whereas if you were to give someone writer access, then you can give them both. So uh, we'll continue with the platform tour now. I'm going to give you a more detailed tour of the workspace itself. So we'll start with the dashboard. Um, that's the leftmost tab, which is where we are right now. Uh, the dashboard of each workspace is where you can find um, uh, uh, hopefully all of the useful relevant information for using that workspace. Uh, this whole field is actually um, one giant markdown field. Um, so if you're familiar with Markdown, it's a lightweight text editing language that allows for very nice formatting. Um, so you can save a bunch of information in the form of uh, bullet points and uh, uh, nested sections and, and links and images. And if you click Save, then it parses everything in the Markdown format. Um, and this is where, um, in this tutorial, you'll go to, uh, for example, download um, the downsampled CRAM file that you'll be using in the workflow part of the tutorial. Um, and again, this is also where you find the link to the Google bucket. So next is the data section of the workspace. And this is uh, where you basically wire uh, inputs and outputs uh, for your workflows. So you can organize all of the metadata um, in, in this tab. Um, so for example, you can create uh, data tables by uh, uploading TSV spreadsheets. Uh, and this is uh, something that I'm not going to go into too much depth because you'll be seeing how it's done during um, the upcoming tutorial that Ali will show you. Um, but basically, in the data tab is where you can uh, keep track of and organize all of your metadata. You can add reference data. Um, this is also where you can find access to other types of workspace data. 
um, and you can also access your Google bucket, your uh, workspace dedicated Google bucket. The notebook section is where you access um, Jupyter notebooks and uh, we'll be uh, going through one of these in the uh, last portion of today's webinar. Specifically, we'll be doing this uh, GA for GH DERS URI using R tutorial. Um, and uh, Terra uh, is integrated with uh, Jupyter Notebooks in both R and Python. Uh, in case anyone is interested in using Python, I know this cohort focuses mo mostly on R. Um, but you can also create notebooks from scratch um, you can uh, upload your own IPYNB files. Um, <clears throat> and this is also where you can send notebooks to other workspaces. And you can actually do this from public uh, workspaces. So if we were still in the public read-only version, um, we would be able to go to the notebook section and see what all the different notebooks inside of it are. And even though we couldn't necessarily open them and uh, uh, run any of the computations, you'd only be able to open preview uh, uh, read-only versions. Um, we can send these to other workspaces. So here I could click on copy to another workspace and I would just write out the name of a workspace to which I have access. And then I would just go to that workspace and open the notebook there. Uh, the Finally, the workflows tab where, um, again, you'll be doing a lot of uh, today's tutorial. This is where um, you go to uh, 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 find uh, workflows that you're uh, going to run against your data. Um, so you can actually find uh, workflows uh, in the same exact way as you would from the data library section. Um, I'm sorry, not from the data library section, but from the uh, code and workflows library section. Um, so you could uh, very quickly uh, uh, get some of these suggested workflows, or you can go to the doc store or the broad methods repo uh, to search for whatever workflow you're interested in. And once you have that workflow in your workspace, um, you would go uh, into the view for the workflow and make uh, a whole bunch of selections based on how you want to run that workflow. So one very important thing is to make sure that you've selected the uh, right version of the workflow. Um, and uh, then you can select what data you'll be running against. Um, and one very important thing about Terra is that it allows you to either run your workflows with the inputs defined by the data table. Um, so uh, uh, you'll be seeing that later on. So when you have uh, this option selected, then the uh, inputs and outputs will actually be linked to the spreadsheets you have in your data section. Um, but you can also run everything um, based on uh, uh, straight file paths. So it gives you uh, both options. Um, so before you're able to uh, run analysis, you have to make sure that all of the required fields are filled out. You can see that there's a little warning sign here that says that not all of the required fields are filled out. Here's um, a, a required attribute that you'll have to that you'll have to fill out as part of the tutorial, um, and then uh, something similar can be true for outputs. Uh, although inputs obviously will usually have more required fields. Uh, incidentally, you can save these configurations by downloading a JSON file. So if I were to click this button right here, I would download a JSON file that has all of these. Uh, attributes. And if I were to then uh, create a, uh, a blank version of this workspace or of this workflow, either here or in some other workspace, I could then upload that JSON file and have those all filled out very quickly. Anton, JSON file is a fairly new concept that I think many people without being in the field of 
computer science or technology would know. Could you define JSON for everyone? Um, so, you know, someone else might be able to give a more detailed answer uh, than, than I, but um, overall a JSON file is uh, the attributes for running a workflow like this. So all of these um, attributes um, for different types of tasks and different types of variables can be saved in the form of a JSON file. So it gives a kind of uh, a, a fast way of saving um, the, the wiring of the workflow. What are the uh, inputs and what are the outputs? Right, so JSON files are a general format that um, are, is used a lot I, in, in um, modern uh, uh, cloud-based computing. I, I've only introduced, been introduced to these in the last couple of years. So um, it's just a way, a text file generally that to way uh, to match um, some data with a label. And that's how it's used in this workflow piping. Anton, just a quick time check. Um, it's almost uh, 1245. Um, so I think we have adding and organizing data in the cloud from 1225 to 1255. Just wanted to give you the heads up. Oh, okie dokie. I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and head it, hand it over to Ali in just a minute then. Um, I'll just say that uh, here in the workflow, um, in the workflow view, you can also look at the Widdle script for that workflow. Um, you can't edit it in this view. You would have to do that um, elsewhere, uh, but at least you can see uh, what the script looks like. Um, and then once you've saved uh, everything with the um, required inputs, then you'll be able to launch that analysis. Once you launch that analysis, it'll show up here in your job history tab. So your job history will contain all of the workflows that have been run uh, in this workspace and it contains links to the uh, outputs and it contains a lot of other useful information about um, how those workflows ran, if there are any errors. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so I think with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to my colleague, Ali, to uh, take you through the data in the cloud portion of our webinar. Okay, okay so I'm going to talk um, about data in the cloud, data on Terra, because when you're working in the cloud, the situation with data is pro one of the most different things about um, doing a research analysis. Um, so I'm going to try and give you a high, a high level view. Okay, so I'm going to very briefly, because we're a little bit behind schedule, um, give you some data catalyst Biodata Catalyst data resources. Then I'm going to talk about where is the data actually. Um, and once you know where it is, how do you organize it with tables? Because the beautiful thing about working in the cloud is you can work with data that is a lot of different places. And tables, the workspace tables in your work uh, data tab help you organize those. I'm going to then talk about storage options in Terra. Um, just so you have a conceptual idea of where the data are when you're doing your analysis and then segue into how to access the data in those different places for analysis. And last but definitely not least, how to bring your own data if you have it on a local um, non-cloud um, storage to Terra. Biodata Catalyst data resources. Uh, you all have access to these slides, so I'm actually not going to go over uh, um, this. Very, I'm going to just very quickly breeze through what data is available, a um, little bit about data harmonization, and a tiny piece of the data access overview. Um, and there are some resources and links actually in the slides that will help you. So here's a, a high level um, data available. It's mostly the, uh, the top med data set, which is in the data library. Um, and this may be slightly out of date, but there's some links to um, uh, the current, current, some current data sets. And um, as you know, there, there are, there's always new data being added in response to researchers like our Biodata Catalyst fellows. Um, data harmonization is really great when you're working with data from different studies because it means that the variable names and um, different uh, pieces are all unified. So it makes it easier to do the same analysis. 
and those that's all um, done by the data coordinating center um, which decides on the variables that are going to be the clinical variables to harmonize and what the harmonized values are going to be there's also unharmonized clinical data available in in top med um, and you can find all of those in the gen 3 search engine which we will be using shortly the gen 3 platform hosts genomic data um, associated with the um, the phenotypic data. Uh, it includes CRAM and VCF files along with their respective index files. Um, and you can read more about that at those links. Big picture overview for data access. Here's you, the user on the left. Um, you have your ERA or your RAS login credentials, um, your researcher auth uh, service credentials, and that acts as the conduit between you and Gen3. Gen3 actually um, manages the data that's hosted in different data buckets up here and um, act, passes off to the analysis platforms. Terra um, Picture is, is uh, another data, data platform and seven bridges. Um, it's not shown on here, but you can also um, move data in between the Terra and seven bridges platform. Um, which I'm not going to talk about today. So where is the data actually? So I'm going to talk about the data library, data in the cloud, and then um, Anton already talked about linking authorization to Terra, so I'm just going to breeze over that. So here's the data library, and you see I've conveniently taken a screenshot that includes top med data, which is specifically aimed at Biodata Catalyst users. The data in the Terra data library is actually hosted elsewhere in the cloud. So the data are stored in different cloud locations um, in unstructured cloud storage. Um, this includes Google buckets that are outside of the workspace. It includes uh, the workspace bucket right here in the, inside the workspace and includes um, unstructured storage that's managed and uh, by platforms like Gen3, which is an external platform. Um, in addition, there's data on the, the cloud environment, VM and persistent disk. So that's inside Terra. And I'm gonna go over that in a second. This, I just wanted to give a big picture view of the different cloud locations. Uh, Anton went over the link credentials. This is what this is the what um, the the profile looks like, and you see here's the NHLBI Biodata Catalyst Framework. Um, it will give your username when the link expires and a link to log in. And um, as Anton showed, you need to first log into Gen3, um, and then you go to your profile page in Terra, follow the link and you need to renew the link every 15 days. This is super important because if you are in the middle of an analysis and um, your link runs out, your analysis could possibly fail. Um, it's, and the error message when you, can't, you just can't access the data because your link has expired is not intuitive. So it's a good idea to keep up on your, um, your data authorization um, link to Terra. It's a wonderful thing that you can authorize the data you get. You can basically bring in your authorization and Terra um, handles everything behind the scenes, like, like Elisa said. Elisa said. Um, but you just need to be on top of it. OK, your data is in a lot of different places. It's a lot of different kinds of data. So how do you organize it in Terra? The answer is in your workspace data page, there are dedicated sections for different kinds of data, all of which you will use for your project. Input data is in the top, top left um, tables. We're gonna go through, we're gonna create one in a few minutes. Um, reference data is the option for preloaded human references. These are pretty large, so it's nice that it's built in for you. Um, other data includes workspace data, which I will talk about when we run the workflow. There's certain data files like Docker's or reference files that are used no matter what your analog, no matter what analysis, what what particular sample you're running. And 
to keep those all in one place, you can use the workspace data table. And then down at the very bottom, this files icon lets you look at what data are in your workspace bucket. So very briefly, this is what a data table looks like. It's kind of like a spreadsheet, except it doesn't have the functionality. You can't run a formula on it. It's just the keeping track of part of the spreadsheet. And each row in a spreadsheet, this is a participant table. So it's a table of 2,504 participants. Each row has a different participants information. And this table, it has their demographics, um, their, their gender, some things like that. And it, it is identified by our participant ID you see right here on the left. Each column in a table is a different, a different variable. Um, there's the ID column, which is always the, the first column. You notice this table has a column of, of CRAE files and a column of CRAM files. And the data in this table are actually the links to those locations in the, in the cloud. So those unstructured data um, has an ID that tells um, everyone where it's actually located. Um, and for Gen 3 data, it's, called, it's a DERS URI, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, for your workspace bucket, it's going to look like GS colon slash slash. It's kind of like the file structure in the cloud. Um, and data in different tables are connected by their ID. So you notice that this participant table ID is also a column in the, um, in the sample table. And since if you upload the participant table first, and then you upload this sample table next, Terra already has this variable participant ID inside in another table. And whenever you reference the part, this column in from as a in this column, it will Terra can make the connection back to the other table. And I'll talk about that when I run a workflow. Okay, this is an example of those workspace level resources. So the uh, workspace data table looks like this. It has what, what the um, resource is and then where in the cloud it is. Um, so again, this is a link to the actual file in the cloud. Okay, now I've given you the big picture of storage in the cloud. I've told you how you organize it in Terra. Um, and now I'm going to go a little deeper into the storage options on the Terra platform, because again, conceptually, it's, it's a little bit of a leap to what, um, what you've been doing um, prior to working in the cloud. So the first type of storage in Terra is this unstructured cloud storage, the workspace bucket. It gets created when you um, create a workspace, it's dedicated storage um, and data tables, like I just showed you, um, can organize and reference the data inside it using the, um, the, the path link here. It's similar to external buckets, um, which are organized and, and managed kind of the same way, but it's just associated with this workspace. For example, if you protected your workspace with an authorization domain, only people in that authorization domain group can access the, the data in your workspace bucket. So that's um, something to know. And when, you're, when you run a workflow, which we're going to do, the, the generated data gets deposited automatically in the workspace bucket. Workflows, which are one of two um, analysis modes in Terra, are integrated with um, this kind of unstructured cloud storage, including your workspace bucket or an external bucket automatically. And this is because workflows accept as input data files with that full path name. The data tables keep track of it. So the data is here in the bucket. Um, the, the buckets linked to the data table by that, that um, string of, uh, that identifies its cloud ID. And the data table sends the information directly to the Whittle, which operates um, on, a, on, a, on a cloud compute that Terra sets up for you. And, I, and I'll go over this again when we, when we run a workflow, which we're going to do. 
um, very quickly. You, I'm sure you're familiar with file structure for your local your local system. Um, when you store things in the cloud, they also have a file structure for Google buckets, unstructured Google buckets. The format looks like this: GS colon slash slash workspace buckets on Terra have this FC and dash, and then it's a long human unreadable string, and then the file name. Uh, luckily, there are some ways you don't have to uh, memorize the string. I'm going to show you some shortcuts for accessing um, in the dashboard the full path, and you can also um, look at your what's in your cloud storage using the files um, icon right here. The second kind of storage is your cloud environment storage. So the cloud environment is um, it's a virtual machine that's in that's in the cloud it's created by Terra um, and it includes the cloud compute the software and dedicated storage it has a detachable persistent disk that um, is, is kind of like a USB storage drive that you can take with you and attach to a different VM if you um, if you uh, recreate this one or if you delete delete one that you're on when you do, uh, let me see. pardon me, when you have more than one workspace in the same billing project, um, many of you may only have one billing project right now. If you create more than one workspace, they share the, the, this virtual machine cloud environment. And so anything in um, any of the workspaces will be able to see um, the data that's kept on this persistent disk. And um, you can access the, this, the data that's stored in the persistent disk or in the virtual machine memory using a terminal that's built into the interactive analysis cloud environment or a notebook. And we're going to go over exactly that in a little bit. Uh, I think Anton covered this, but quickly to create the cloud environment, you just click on the widget, widget at the top and um, you can specify how big your storage is right here. Um, it's worth noting that unlike the cloud environment, which you don't pay for unless it's running, the persistent disk, uh, because it exists, even when you're not running and, and don't even have a cloud environment, you'll be paying for storage. Um, and I, I believe that it tells you how much it costs. It obviously gets bigger the more um, the more data, the larger the disk size. So the last piece I want to mention is um, that persistent disk and v the, the overall VM storage is integrated with interactive analysis. And this makes sense because interactive analysis runs on this virtual machine. So you should think of it as a kind of a, a literally a virtual machine that is managed by but is separate from um, your workspace and your external bucket. And what that means is that if you have data that's in your external bucket, but you want to analyze it in a Jupyter notebook, you will need to transfer it into the, the, um, the persistent disk storage. And I'm going to talk about that again, but I just want to have that in your, like have in your mind, these, there's these two kinds of, of data storage in Terra. They're each associated with a different data mode, and you may have to move the data in order to access it. So speaking of saving and moving data to and from the cloud environment VM, um, you will use a, something called GSUtil. Um, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a command, uh, a set of commands that runs in a notebook or in a cloud in, or in a terminal. It includes um, things like copy, move, list directory, um, that sort of things. The link at the bottom of here gives the full list of commands. And I think on the next slide, there's a link to some documentation that it um, gives step-by-step -step how to move things. Um, let's see. Something that's important to understand, um, inbound networking is blocked. So if you are in a... Um, a cloud. Uh, if you are on the internet, connected to the internet, but not 
in this, um, this VM, this cloud environment, you cannot move data into it. The only way to exchange data in between the virtual machine, the persistent disk or the, the VM um, memory is to, you can take data that's in the persistent disk and push it out into the cloud, like to a Google bucket or an external bucket. And you can um, be in the persistent disk and pull data in from the workspace bucket or other cloud storage, but you can't, you can't reach in um, from the internet writ large. Okay, accessing data for analysis. I, this is a little bit of a repeat um, because I mentioned it already, but I'm just gonna reiterate. There are two kinds of analysis on Terra. There's um, workflow, which is, kind of, which is your, your bulk, uh, bulk analysis generally, um, and they're integrated with data tables. So they, the input data is unstructured cloud storage. Um, so either the, the workspace bucket or the external bucket or data from Gen 3, which is identified by its own kind of um, identifier. You put those, put those data locations in a table and it just works. If you have data that's in the cloud environment storage and you wanna analyze it with a workflow, you're going to need to copy it. And there are some tools in the BioData Catalyst collection that specifically help you to, um, to make tables if you have data in, um, in a, in a workspace bucket or an external bucket. For a notebook analysis, it's just the opposite. Um, the data is needs to be inside the virtual machine, which has a memory, VM memory and the, this persistent disk. Um, again, if your data that you need to, that you're wanting to analyze in a notebook is in the workspace bucket, you're gonna need to move it into there. Which brings us to our last but not least portion on bringing your own data. We talked a little bit about protecting data with authorization domains. Authorization domain is a Terra managed group. So those of you who didn't have any um, anything in your dropdown, that's because you hadn't you hadn't created a Terra managed group. Um, the special thing about this group is it has very strictly defined permission rules. Um, any workspace only only allows access to users that are in all the authorization domains that protect that workspace. So if you have a workspace that includes an authorization domain, domain for genomic data and one for phenotypic data, um, you have to have both in order to access that workspace. Protects all the data in the workspace. And importantly, it protects the generated data. So if you run an analysis and you've generated data that's now in your workspace bucket, or if you, um, if you clone the workspace and um, your collaborator makes, makes uh, some, some generated data in that copy, the authorization domain protects everything. So it's kind of, once you set it, everything that propagates from that workspace is protected and includes the authorization domain. And that is also why you want to think carefully about um, what authorization domain you want to apply. So think about kind of what you anticipate coming out of the workspace. Again, you need to set it up before creating a workspace. You include your collaborators to share the data. Those can be external collaborators and it can, the group can be updated and it protects access to derived files in the workspace bucket. Um, primary files stored on Gen 3 have their own protection uh, by um, you know, authorization. Uh, this is for all the data that's in, that, in the workspace bucket. I'm gonna give an overview of bringing data. Your locate, the options are cloud storage, the cloud environment, the VM, and non-cloud local storage, which could include your personal computer or your institution, HPC, or other system. So data transfer can only directly, usually, go between cloud storage, which has that ID, and the, the VM, or cloud storage and non-cloud or local storage. Um, some institutions you may be able to access from outside the institution. And if that's the case, you can, um, you can, uh, you'll have an extra arrow um, going between two and three. What, the, what you're going to use is a terminal to transfer the data. 
Um, and we recommend using gsutil. Um, it's, a, it's a utility command that lets you access cloud storage from the command line. And this screenshot shows you what the command looks like. Um, to access gsutil, there are two options depending on where you are. If you're transferring to or from um, that local system, you'll need to run gsutil in your terminal locally. And um, there are instructions in this, in this link document about how to do that if you don't have it already installed. And this document has um, a lot of the, the most useful, most typical gsutil commands. Um, if you access from the um, the VM, the terminal already has gsutil installed, and I think it also has FTP, SSH, it has all those uh, other pieces also installed, so um, you can use the terminal to transfer things that way. So from the, from the VM, the persistent, persistent disk, Again, you're going to use gsutil. Um, you're going to use it from the built-in terminal or a notebook. And the notebook part is um, Anton's going to cover in, in the interactive um, analysis part. But you would, you're going to start the terminal, which is in, this, in the widget. It's this um, far left. And then you can just use, um, use the regular commands. And here's just a very quick list of um, some of the some of the commands you can use in the terminal to access um, access files across the cloud. And when you're running in the in the cloud environment terminal, you have all all of the web operations are open open for you. I know that was a lot of information. I also know I'm running a, we're running a little bit behind, so I want to ask if there are any questions really quickly. I know I threw a lot of information at you, but now we're going to do some actual um, hands-on work, which sometimes is nice because it, it um, makes some of those concepts concrete. So what we're going to do first is if you can join me in your copy of, um, of the, the webinar workspace, and there's some, some resources that are re really useful, but we are going to make a data table for that we're going to run a workflow analysis on. And um, I'm going to run you through the process. So there's a link right here for a downsampled CRAM file um, that's in the cloud. And if you click on the link, you should be given the opportunity to download um, to download the, the file. And you can put it wherever you want. I'll put. I'll leave it in my downloads. Um, you can rename it if you want to. NA one two eight seven eight happens to be a particular open access um, case. So you want to just save the save the data. I've tried this before, obviously. So I'm going to replace it. And um, so once you download this cram file onto your local, wherever you are right now, this is going to simulate um, your data. So we're going to now upload the file to the, to the workspace bucket. So we've taken it from the cloud, an open access bucket, downloaded it to our local machine, um, and now we're going to upload it to the workspace bucket. So if you go to your data tab and you look in, click on the files icon, um, you see there's, there's, a, there's a, um, a folder for notebooks, because notebooks, the JPY, JPYNB folder files are stored in here. Um, and in order to upload this file, because it's a small file and it's just a single one, you can click on the little plus and it will allow you to upload the file. And if you find it and you only need the CRAM file, you can, you can upload the CRAM file as well, but you only need the CRAM file. And there it is. 
I'm going to kind of walk through this slowly. And if you have questions, you should definitely ask them in the chat. And uh, there's a lot of people online who can who can help you. Okay, so we know that CRAM is now in the workspace bucket. However, that does not mean that it's immediately accessible to our tools because it's not in a table, but we're going to remedy that. I'm going to walk you through making a table um, that is just to keep track of this one CRAM file that we're then going to run um, in a workflow, which is also in the, in the workspace. So to make a, to make a, a data table from scratch, you're just going to use a um, your favorite spreadsheet editor. Usually I use Excel, but because I knew I didn't want to be swapping windows, I'm actually going to use um, Google Sheets and I've set it up. Can everyone see, uh, hopefully you can see this e easily. I, I'm going to make the, make the, make it a little bigger. We have one sample and we, and we have one file. So how many people can guess how many rows are going to be in this data table? There's going to be, we need to have a header row. So there's going to be definitely one. And then each row is its own sample. We have one sample. So there's going to be one header row and one sample row. Okay, and how many columns are we going to have? I mentioned, but I'm going to reiterate, the first column of any data table in Terra is the ID column. So it's the ID that is associated with um, whatever your table is keeping track of. Um, this is going to be a sample table because we're, we, we're keeping track of, of samples. Um, so it's going to have an ID column. And then in addition to the ID column, it's going to have a column where we keep track of the CRAM file. And it's going to be the location in the cloud. So the header of the spreadsheet um, is what is, is going to show up in the top line of your table on Terra. Um, and the first column header has a very particular format and it looks like this entity. Entity is a fancy word for uh, the table name. So it's the idea is it's whatever um, piece of data your table keeps track of. I'm going to call this one Ali Mike Mike test sample. Whatever you put after entity is what the table is going to be called. And then you need to follow it by underscore ID. So entity colon, and then the name of your table, which can be whatever you want, and then underscore ID. The next column is going to be it's going to keep track of the data and I have a cram file. So I'm going to, because I'm not very imaginative, call it the cram column. So this, the, so that's the header. And you could have as many columns as you want. If you had, an, you could have another column for the, the cram index, you could have the date, you could have the study, um, any information that you want need to associate with um, this particular sample. So for the sample ID, again, you can call it whatever you want. I believe it has to be only underscores and hyphens and letters. So I'm going to call it, I'm going to, I'm going to just use my initials and today's date. Say the 15th, 16th. And now we come to the last column, which is the CRAM file itself. What you need to include in the spreadsheet is the full path to that, that piece, that data file in the cloud. And I'm going to show you a shortcut for finding the full path. If you go to the dashboard and you open in browser, this will take you to a new tab. This is, um, this is the, the storage, your Google bucket on Google Cloud Platform. And sometimes a Google Cloud Platform can be a little challenging to work with, but the nice thing is right here is the, is the file. If you click on it, it gives you, um, right here is the URI, the Uniform Resource Identifier. 
And that full thing, which you can copy by uh, clicking on copy keyboard, is what you will want to put in here. So that's it. You have the ID, ID column, um, the data column. This is a cram. And I've included the full, the full path. And you don't have to make it a link. So the next step is you need to save it, or in the case of Google Sheets, download it. And it has to be a particular format, which is tab separated values. If you're in um, Microsoft Excel, you want to save it as a tabs delimited text, which is a .txt. Tara accepts them both. And I'm going to just call it sample. Test sample, and I will, and it's going to be in my download. And make sure the format is tab separated values, and click save. Once you've done that, you've that is that is your table. Go return to your workspace in the data tab. Click on the little blue plus icon, and. You can, you can drag and drop, or you can click to select it. You notice mine is conveniently highlighted right there. Open it. And if you upload it, when you click to expand, there it is. The test, test sample has my name. And uh, if you hover over the, over the, um, the link here, it gives a full path. So congratulations, you've created and uploaded your first data file. Okay. Allie. Yes. Would you mind uh, going over again how to find the path for the cram file? Yeah, yeah. That was a shortcut that someone else showed me. So if you, you go to your dashboard, on the right, it, it is a little section for your Google bucket. And if you click on the open in browser, it will lead you to your your it's it's on the console your google bucket on the console and you should see you should see your um this is everything that's in your in your google bucket your workspace google bucket and if you click on the um the whatever if you called it if you left it with that name you click on the cram file and then down here under uri you can copy the full path it starts with gs colon slash slash fc Allie, quick question. Uh, yeah. In the dashboard of the workspace that we cloned, mm -hmm. there's also a link to the downsampled, downsampled mm -hmm. cram file. Um, will using that one also work? The cray, um, the cray file, you mean? Um, the cram and the cray. They, they're both there. Um, oh, oh, we, oh, no. Do you see? So this link, do you see how this says HTTPS? Yep. This is a different link format. Um, and that will, the workflow will not accept that. So if you use that link in your spreadsheet, um, it will not work. So you could use GS colon uh, slash slash. If it's, the, if it's the same. Dash test, right? That's another option for referring to a, to a file in the, in the Google buckets is uh, if you, if you have, if somebody gives you a link like this, for example, if you want to reference it, you can ignore the beginning of it and just do GS colon slash slash and then GATK dash test dash. Okay. Data yeah. Slash. So, so that's just right. more information for, for, for folks. Yeah. So now you have a data table and we're going to put that aside for a little bit and talk about more realistic um, data. Okay. So that was a pretty simple table, but you are working with more um, complex data. And we're going to talk about um, data discovery and exploration with Gen 3 on Terra. So I'm going to give a brief overview of Gen 3 um, cloud data sets. I'm going to talk about the how Gen 3 organizes the data, how it's uh, on the platform, um, go over exporting the data to Terra, and analyzing Gen 3 data in Terra. In Terra. And then we'll, we'll actually go through the process of finding, um, finding some data in, in Gen 3 and exporting it to Terra.
Biodata Catalyst and Anvil, are, these are two examples of consortia that are using and supporting data in the clouds. Um, you can see um, from here a little bit about what, what data is, is currently available in Gen 3 on, in these consortia, um, and there's more to come. Um, it's petabytes of data, and by bringing all these data sets together, you can, users can do a, a, a variety of genomic analyses on thousands, and I think in some cases, tens of thousands of participants. Uh, the thing about so much data is it can be hard to find what you need and to use it effectively, and that's where Gen3 and Terra come in. So, so there's um, Gen, this is what Gen3 looks like, and we'll go through it in, in very shortly. Um, there's centralized and multi-tiered access. Um, you can look at data that you have access to and data that you don't have access to. Um, and you can get a, a big overview picture um, on, the, on the right, as I'll show you when we're actually in Gen3. You can use the, the filters and the faceted search to identify the data sets of interest. You can search against um, of all available products, projects, um, and, um, and you can create exactly the cohorts you want based on their, their clinical attributes. There's a very convenient export all to Terra. Um, if you want to do, once you've found your cat, cohort to analyze on the Terra platform. You can, it's just one, one click. Um, and let's talk about one, what the data look like when you do that. So there's several different types of data on Gen 3. There's, um, and they're, they're associated with different um, nodes. The blue node is the clinical node and it covers genomic and transcriptomic. The green node is the phenotypic data mode. Um, it's unharmonized clinical data as well as the harmonized clinical data. And then there's a purple mode, which is administrative, um, the project, the study, and the subject. Um, this is a graphic representation. The data that's in Biodata Catalyst actually has quite a bit of complexity to it. Um, the, the nodes are, I described that this is the administrative node, the, the clinical and the, um, or no, this is, sorry, the clinical and then um, the genomic is you follow the, the green. Um, each of the nodes is connected by a, a link and each of these links is a uh, UUID. That's right. Sorry, yeah. universally unique ID. So it's a very long um, number that you, that uniquely connects each piece of data in um, in the down in the downstream to its upstream node. This goes into that a little bit more detail. So the the nodes each have different attributes. Um, not all studies have all the attributes. To find what is there, you, you'll click the node, and I'll show you in Gen 3, and then you open the properties, it shows the, the node here, and these are all the different values, um, and it'll give some information like if it's required for harmonized data, um, that sort of thing. So nodes are connected by universally unique identifiers. Um, each node contains the UID that associates it with the immediate upstream node. So what that means is to connect data across one level, you actually, so if you wanted to connect a person's demographic and lab result data, you would use the subject UUID to go up to find the subject, and then you would go down with the subject lab result UUID to find the associated lab result. So that's kind of an overview. There are tools specifically in the Biodata Catalyst collection that help you to do this automatically. So in Gen 3, when you export the data to Terra using the export all to Terra, it initiates a portable format for bioinformatics export of all the clinical data. 
and the file UUIDs for the selected cohort. So even if you're only interested in um, a particular uh, portion of the data, you, you, get, you get all the clinical data and files. You get the data dictionary metadata and the data dictionary itself. And you can, you can have multiple exports to the same workspace, which lets you max, mix and match um, studies and files because you can put them all in one space for one analysis. The key, as you'll see when we, we actually do this export, is each Gen3 node is an individual Terra table. So your workspace right now has one table with one piece of data. When you export um, the, the data from Gen3 that we're going to look at, the, um, the public access data, I think you get 15 tables. Um, so it looks a little more complex. Again, the um, the tables are going to look very similar, albeit longer than the ones that we made. Um, the, the, the column headers, if it's exported data, will all have this PFB attribute namespace. Um, that lets you differentiate from uh, getting, getting data from different platforms. Um, and I've mentioned this a little bit, but um, all the genomic data files use this Data Repository Service URIs. So we call them DERS URIs. It's an interoperable um, mechanism developed by GA4GH, and it is an ID that's agnostic to cloud infrastructure. So any file with a DERS URI, um, it can be in Azure, it can be on Google. Um, it doesn't. It it doesn't matter what cloud infrastructure it's stored up. So again, that that has plays to the interoperability um, model. Again, the data in different tables are connected via UUIDs. Um, I, I mentioned when I talked about data tables, um, I showed the, the example where the sample table was connected to the participant table by the participant ID. Um, that's how traditional um, data tables are connected in Terra. For Gen 3 data, it's a little more complex because again, you have to go up the tree. You, you use the subject UUID in the demographic table to go up a node, and then you use the lab result UUID, the subject result, uh, the subject UUID in the lab result table to go down the, go down the tree. So it's a little more more complex. Again, there are tutorial um, notebooks in the Biodata Catalyst collection that um, can help you with that. Okay, so unlike um, data in the Google bucket, which has that GS colon identifier, DERS URIs have this DERS identifier. It works exactly the same. And as far as the workflow is concerned, it is exactly the same. So um, if you have a table and it includes a link that's a DERS URI link, it will the, the workflow will just take it in and use that as its input. For notebook analysis, um, remember I, I mentioned that the notebook analysis takes place in that cloud environment and you do have to move things from um, from unstructured cloud storage, including DERS URI data, into the notebook analysis. Um, there's a DERS client library in the Terra Notebooks Utils package. Um, there's an API that you can use with notebooks. There's a client uh, command line interface you can use from the Terra terminal. And um, here's a link to the uh, Notebooks Utils um, README. So, all these packages, that is to say, these all these packages allow you to perform lots of helpful operations, um, like copying the data from, from Gen 3 storage to the cloud environment or to your workspace Google bucket. And the the notebook, one of the notebooks that's in the workspace that you copied today actually has a fairly standalone tutorial that you're going to start with Anton in a little bit. The Broad has a um, utility command package called the FireCloud Service Selector, which enables you to um, 
access a lot of um, functionality uh, that's available to Terra in a notebook. And it helps with automation and scaling and allows flexible data access. Um, and one of the things it does is allow, it allow you to copy and move um, inside a notebook data um, from an, an external Google bucket or a Durst URI um, into the notebook environment. So there's some, um, at the very bottom, there's a, there's a article reference that um, gives some, some more background and information on that. Some of the, the notebooks will, ha will, men will have this package available in them. So you'll see it at work. Um, I just wanted to give you an idea that this is a tool for moving data into the, um, the cloud environment, the VM. Okay, I know that was a lot, but are there any questions or are we good? Next step is to go to Gen 3. So uh, just for reinforcement purposes, um, remind you that you need to log in first. And if someone can send around the, um, the link to that, I'm gonna log in. You choose whichever login you have. takes you right here. Um, before we import, you need to go back to Terra and make sure that you are your, um, you have that link in place. So I'm going to do that right now. So go to your profile, uh, Biodata Catalyst Framework, click to log in. It's fairly quick. And then you notice right now it says uh, link expiration is in a month. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Go back. Okay, so back in Gen 3. So when you're logged in, this is the initial page, um, gives you an idea. There's quite a few, almost half a million subjects in, in the, um, in, on, the, on the Gen 3 platform, 137 studies and this many files. Um, you can click on the dictionary, the graph view. Again, this gives you um, exactly the graph, this is the graph view that I showed you. Um, I'm gonna go down. So if you follow the, um, the biospecimen trail to read groups and there's the submitted unaligned reads, you can click on it to find, uh, there's nine required properties, seven optional properties. If you open, um, these are the thing, these are the um, columns of data, the attributes. So there's going to be uh, the submitter ID, the file size, experimental strategy, data type. Um, so this, this includes BAM file. So I was hoping to find the CRAM file. You're in unaligned reads. Yeah, I know. I, so I need to go up, right? Submitted aligned reads. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to show you where it would be. If you look down. Um, I think it'd be under data format, which is up. OK, yeah. So, so when we exported the data, we would get a table that would be submitted aligned reads. And in that table, there would be there will be a column that includes the cramp file. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Exploring is possibly a little bit more useful. The you can use a faceted search um, on the left. Um, again, you can you can restrict yourself to data that you have access to, or um, you can look at data that you don't have access to. And if you find um, a some data that you are interested in studying, I, I believe it, it, Gen 3 will offer you um, instructions or, 
a contact for how to yeah how to get access for the data sets you want. I'm going to I actually have access to a fair amount of data, but you can um, you can search by the harmonized variables. And you can see um, as you as you as you select what you want, it the numbers will will change. So you so as you're playing with the with the search parameters, you'll you'll see how many how many subjects and how many projects are available. So we're going to look for the open access data set. So if you go under project and search for, I think if you search under tutorial, you do have to spell correctly. Um, and the synthetic data set will come out, has 2,501 samples. If you click on that, and you see there's, gives you the number of subjects, their ratio background, how many are male and how many are female, um, and um, different, what data is some of the data that's available. And again, to export to Terra, you click on the export all to Terra button. And you'll get a message that your export is in progress. And you can close this, but you don't want to navigate away until the export is finished. Um, of course, it's not actually exporting all those genomic data files into your workspace bucket. What it's what it's exporting is tables that include, the tables will include the phenotypic data, um, and they'll also include links, which are DIRST URIs, to the genomic data, which is stored by Gen3. Make sense? So I think this is going to take a few minutes. Um, when it's when the export is done, it will come up with, you'll, you'll get a little, um, menu that asks you you can export to um, to a tutorial workspace which we're not going to do you can create a workspace which means your it will just include the data tables and nothing else or you can export it to a workspace that you already have um, and it will have a drop down menu and you can select the the workspace that you made for this um, for this webinar and it will show up and I do we have any questions because we're going to have a few minutes here and I can I can either wait for it or um, I can move on and. Oh. Luckily, <laughs> so here we have the desk, so you, you need to choose the destination workspace start with a template existing workspace or new workspace so if you start with an existing workspace. And uh, if you if you um, type in <laughs> hopefully you named it something that was memorable. And if you click import um, and it's doing its thing behind the scenes and, it does take a little bit of time. You know, remember my my test sample is right here, um, and we have this data import in progress. Um, it'll do its thing, and it'll Tara will let me know when it's done. And if you refresh the data table, the data page, um, there will be the new data tables from Gen three. Okay, workflows. Now that we have your data. And we know how it's a little bit how it's stored and how it's organized. We want to actually do something with it. So um, in this, I'm going to talk about what's a workflow and how do I set up a workflow to run. I'm going to talk very briefly about three workflows, configuration, best practices. And there's a series of slides about what happens behind the scenes when you launch a workflow that I will probably go through very quickly, but they are in um, the, the your copy of the slide deck. So I'm, I'm less um, worried about that. 
So what is a workflow? So a workflow is a set of instructions comprised of multiple connected steps generally used for automated bulk processing data. What's that mean? It's a it's a series of um, it's a series of scripting scripted commands to manipulate your data. And on Terra, workflows are written in the workflow description language, which is a way to specify data processing workflow. It's intended to be human readable and writable. And generally, it's the second part of an analysis, you've got your data, generally, the workflows is the processing part. So this is what you would use to um, align your BAM, for example, or um, call variants, and then generally, the the outcome is passed to um, the interactive analysis in a Jupyter notebook. That's not always the case of, of the of the um, the way the steps are, but so to set up and run a workflow in Terra, you have two options. I'm going to very quickly talk about it. You can start by selecting data in the data tab and then telling Terra to run a workflow, or you can start from the workflows tab and say, I'm going to run a workflow, and then you choose your data. So it's just a matter of do you choose your data first or do you choose your um, workflow first? And if you select, select the data to analyze, then you're going to, um, these, these three dots is where you will, will click and you'll, you'll get a drop down menu. You can open with a workflow and that'll take you to the workflow configuration page. If you start by selecting a workflow in your workflows tab, you will get to the same data configuration, workflow configuration page, which looks like this. Um, the top has a number of options, um, the version of the workflow, if it comes from DocStore. Um, there you have the option of running the workflow with inputs defined by file paths. So sometimes when you're testing, you might want to just have the, that long file path. But we're going to um, demonstrate best practices, which is using inputs that are found in the data table. Um, there are a couple of, of money saving options down here. Call caching um, allows you to, um, Terra will, will keep, um, keep intermediate outputs after a task is finished within the, within the workflow, um, which lets you go back and rerun, um, re, rerun the workflow without recalculating. Um, and if you click on the little I right here, it gives you a, a little more detail on um, these money saving options, um, when you might want to use them, that sort of thing. Uh, if you started from by selecting data, your data is already going to be uh, selected in step two. And um, if you've started from the workflow, you'll, you'll click here to select the data. And I'll show you that when we do the walkthrough. Um, and then the last part of the workflow configuration is uh, in this bottom section. You can look at the workflow script if you want to. Um, it just sometimes that helps with troubleshooting. Um, and these two sections the, are where you define the inputs and the outputs. Um, and we're going to run through them. So I'm just going to give that overview in the slide. So I'm going to talk about three best practices for configuring workflows. The first is to use data tables for inputs. So you, if you specify that you're using data tables, you still have to tell the Whittle, the workflow, where to find the data. And you do that in by filling in the att this attributes field. So here are all the variables that the workflow runs. This is the type of, of variable it is here on the middle. And then at the far right are the fields that are the actual variable attributes for, the, for this run. Some of them are already pre-configured. That JSON that uh, Alyssa and um, Anton talked about is something that allows you to fill in a lot of these attributes um, using a text file and, and just upload it and it fills it in without having to manually fill them in. When you have a variable in the in the data table that you want to want to access, the way you specify that is by typing this dot. 
So this dot tells the workflow, go to the data table and look for the column that's identified afterwards. So for example, we have an input cram, the attribute in the data table is going to be this dot, and then it's whatever whatever the heading, the header is that contains the link for the cram file. And that is a lot of words, but when I demo it, I think it'll be more understandable. So using data tables for inputs um, let saves time and um, lets you scale up. You can you can see where if you have this filled, if you if you were using um, individual individual um, the full path lengths here, and you were you were running on more than one um, more than one sample, you can see how it would get pretty tedious pretty quickly. But with data tables, you set them up once, or in the case of exporting from Gen 3, Gen 3 sets up your data table and then you can run it, you know, it's the same setup, whether you're running it in on one sa sample in the table or 20 or 2000. To the same point, um, all those workspace level metadata files like dockers and um, and intervals, um, you it's we recommend setting up a workspace data table um, for for all those. The workflow that we're actually going to run does not do that. It has it has full path lengths for each each variable here, um, and we offer as a homework assignment to set it set it up to run on workspace data. So I'll show you that as well. And then the last piece, I mentioned that outputs from a workflow analysis get put in your Google bucket, and I. I think you saw the, the name of your Google bucket already, and it's not very human friendly. Um, when, you, when you run a workflow, it creates, um, it creates several, uh, several directories, folders where your, uh, your data are stored, and each of those has a non-human readable name as well. So if you, if you put this dot, and a variable name into the outputs folder, it will write, it will write the link for this for that variable, that output file into the data table, which can be very handy. And we'll run it and you'll see. So basically, when you submit a workflow, there's many things that happen behind the scenes. Um, here you are submitting your workflow. Um, you've set up the, you've set up the the workflow and the data model with the table and the Docker, um, and you hit submit, and Terra sends the resources out to the cloud, and it sets up the compute engine, and it executes your workflow, and then it when the when it's done, it writes it back to the workspace storage bucket. I guess that was pretty quick. <laughs> um, so that's a you can look at it in more detail, but that's basically what's happening behind the scenes that Terra takes care of you, takes care for you. So, hands-on demo. Let's go back to if you return to your your dashboard and if you go to the data page, you'll probably have all the tables. These are all the tables from Gen three. If you uh, look carefully, they may look familiar. Um, each of them is a node um, in Gen 3, and, um, and uh, they're alphabetical, which is a little bit of a pain. But And if you look under the submitted aligned reads, and you scroll over, there's a cram file, and this is the DIRS URI for the CRAM file. So nice to see that showed up. But let's go over to the workflow. And there's only one. So this is the actual aligner that's used for top med, um, harmonized top med data, I believe. So if you click on that, 
And the first thing you need to do is um, you can leave you can leave the version alone. Um, you want to make sure that it's running on inputs defined by the data table. And the first thing you do in step one is select the root entity type. Just means what data table is the data actually in. Um, and it's conveniently chosen the one that I want to use. So all the tables are listed. You should choose the one that has the down sampled, um, the down sampled um, cram file that that you made. And you can select um, you can select data. There's only one row, but if you had more than one row, you could select um, which rows you wanted to. If you had a, a, a table that had a lot of data samples, but you only wanted um, to run a few of them, this is a very convenient way of doing that. You, you could just, you could just uh, select the ones you wanted. And then you can click OK. OK, so let's check our inputs. So you notice that there are a lot of full paths here. So this workflow um, is not set up to run from the, um, the workspace data table. Um, so it has all these um, complete file paths in here, which is not best practices, but um, gives you an opportunity to um, just see what that's like. So the only the only ones we need to there's there's a number of optional inputs which you can hide over here. The only one we need is this. Um, you see with the the yellow arrow is the input cram file, and I know it's in the um, it's in the data table. So you type this dot, and it will give me. The drop-down menu gives me both op the options for all the columns of data that, that are in the test sample table. So I'm looking for the CRAM. I'm not looking for the ID. I'm looking for the CRAM. So I'll select the, the CRAM column and then save. And last step, we've, so we've selected the, the input table, the, the root entity type where the data are. We've defined um, the, the column of that input data table. And what's the last piece that we need? Write the outputs to the data table because we don't want a bunch of non-human readable stuff jumbled together in the bucket. So um, there are two outputs, one's the output output um, cram index and once the output cram and I'm just going to call them I'm going to call this one oh type in this dot so it will write to the table and this dot mm, I have to call it output cram I realize because if I wrote this dot cram it would overwrite. Okay, so you made this table, you know, there are no, there's no output cray and output cram column in your table. But when you specify the output like this, when when the whittle when the workflow runs, Tara will make a new column in your data table, and it will write the data and the nice bit is it will associate all that data with the same with the with the original input. So if you save it, and you notice that my run analysis is blue, it was gray when I didn't have everything filled in. Um, so that is that is configuring. And if you click run analysis, it confirms tells you where it's going to be run by. And you launch and Tara will take you to the job history page, um, which will tell you the status of your workflow. So remember I said, um, does a number of things. Right now it's in the queue, which means that Tara is kind of lining up the resources. And in, it, this should not take very long to run. It'll probably be done um, before the next uh, session begins. But that, that is it. 
Fabulous. Thanks, everybody. Um, we're a tiny bit behind schedule, but I think we can um, get through this last part pretty quickly. Um, we're going to end today's webinar by talking about interactive analysis uh, using Jupyter Notebooks. So Tara has uh, built in Jupyter Notebooks capabilities, and I'm going to go over very quickly at a high level what Jupyter Notebooks are and where they live within the Terra architecture, and then we'll actually launch a Jupyter Notebook so you can see all of this in action. Um, so what we're going to cover is first, what is a Jupyter Notebook, and then we'll show you uh, all of the steps for setting it up and customizing it within Terra. Um, <clears throat> and we'll see this both in the slides and in the demo. So we'll go very quickly uh, over the slides. Um, uh, at a high level, a Jupyter Notebook is an open source interactive web tool that allows you to interact with live code and create um, a lot of uh, very nicely formatted visualizations. Um, it does this by enabling you to use both uh, live code in either R or Python, as well as markdown code. Um, and in Terra, uh, you run a notebook by uh, spinning up a cloud environment, um, uh, which is a type of virtual machine that's designed to allow executing and editing code on our remote cloud-based server. So your virtual machine is tied to your billing project via the workspace where you uh, uh, launch that particular notebook. Um, and then the uh, tools that are built in to help you interact with that are both of the Jupyter Notebook uh, interface that you might be used to if um, you've uh, worked with Jupyter Notebooks, but also we've uh, made sure to build in a way for you to just open a terminal directly to your virtual machine. Um, your virtual machine is customizable, so um, you can customize the size of the virtual machine, the programming language, as well as um, the uh, environment um, in terms of what kinds of packages you start with. And there's a few uh, ways in which you can customize exactly what code packages are available to your notebook from the get-go. And we'll go over how you uh, uh, customize those. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, there are a lot of built-in uh, customization options um, for disk space and, and how many CPUs and, and, and the amount of memory. Um, you'll notice that uh, when you are looking at the uh, cloud environment widget, there will be a real-time cost estimate for how much that uh, particular uh, amount of computation should cost per hour. Um, there's also an adjustable auto pause. So if you um, forget that you have your uh, uh, notebook virtual machine running and you walk away from your computer or you have it open in another tab, it will actually auto pause. And um, if, you, if you have a computation that takes a very long time to run and you want to adjust that auto pause, you can do that also. Um, and there are a lot of options for uh, pre-configured environments as well as a way to create your own custom environment and add um, and launch from that custom environment using a startup script. So using startup scripts is something we won't cover in too much detail um, in, in this tutorial, but just to give you an idea, you can create a startup script. There's a, a, an example of what that looks like on the next slide. And then you just put that up in a Google bucket and you use the Google bucket URI um, in the startup uh, cloud environment widget, and we'll show you during the tutorial where that would go if we were using it. So this is what an example startup script might look like. You would write it, you would save it uh, to a Google bucket, and then you would use that um, address as your um, startup script. There are a couple of different options for uh, how to launch notebooks, or rather how you're uh, going to look at your notebooks, um, and you'll see that again um, momentarily, uh, but just to give you a brief idea, there is a preview mode, which is what you see as soon as you open a notebook, and you can see the preview mode um, even in a public workspace to which you don't have compute access. Um, you will need compute access to open that notebook in either edit or playground mode. So the preview mode lets you basically see what the contents are, but you can't edit any of the cells. Um, 
you can edit the cells in either edit or playground mode. Um, and so they're effectively the same, the difference being that uh, playground mode is there for when multiple people are working on the same notebook inside of the same workspace. Um, and that's there so that um, you don't overwrite one another as you're working. So the person who hits edit first will be uh, the person whose uh, edits are being auto-saved. Um, and then it's kind of a, a first come first serve type of situation where uh, then that notebook is open in edit mode only for that person until they close out of edit mode. But if other people want to be playing around with the code, um, trying out uh, if different things are working, um, then they can do that collaboratively by just going to the playground mode instead. And it'll be a separate instance of the same notebook. So the notebooks all have uh, code cells, which are cells uh, where you can write executable code in either R or Python. And they also have markdown cells. And we'll show you where you can change a cell from being a code to a markdown cell. And basically, uh, whichever cell type is assigned to that cell, then you just have to make sure that you are using the correct code syntax. And then when you hit run for that cell, it will parse it in that given language, whether it be R or Python or Markdown. And then finally, we wanted to make sure that um, you were aware of the fact that you can, if you prefer, uh, working in a, in a traditional terminal, um, you can actually open a terminal that goes directly uh, to your virtual machine. And we'll show you how to do that uh, momentarily. And uh, I just want to point out that, um, as Ali mentioned, uh, this terminal view is how you would communicate with um, other locations. So you couldn't necessarily open a terminal on your local machine and then send uh, uh, data or copy data to your Google bu uh, bucket. Um, what you would do is open the terminal from your virtual machine, and then you can push and pull data from there. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll, I'll uh, take questions at the end of the tutorial. So we're just going to move right on to the hands-on portion. So here I am back in my copy of the workspace that I cloned earlier. Uh, I'm going to go to the notebooks tab I'm going to start by clicking on the notebook that we're about to look at so that you can see, first of all, the preview mode, and second of all, the location of these buttons, as well as some more options you have um, in this three dot button. So you can copy this notebook, you can send it to another uh, workspace. Um, and as soon as I click edit, these options are going to disappear and it's going to say, now you're going to have to wait uh, a few minutes in order to do in order uh, for the cluster to spin up for your virtual machine to be ready. Before I do that, I have to show you the uh, cloud environment widget. <clears throat> so here is where you can choose which type of environment you want to spin up. I'm going to use this um, R uh, bioconductor uh, uh, environment that is our uh, sort of most up-to-date uh, pre-configured environment. Um, and of course, this is where you can adjust your um, uh, compute profile. Uh, this is where you would add your startup script if you were interested in using a, a unique startup script. Um, this is also where you can adjust the size of your persistent disk. And so I'll go ahead and click update. Um, it gives me a message that says there's downtime, downtime required. This is also where it would give me a message um, that says that it's going to overwrite or replace my persistent disk if I already had a persistent disk associated with this um, with this notebook. So it would give me a little uh, a little warning about that, and it would give me, uh, in some cases, the option of either replacing my persistent disk or detaching my persistent disk so that I can then reattach it um, and save that memory. So. Now you can see that our little play icon here has turned into a uh, waiting icon, and it says that the cloud environment update is in progress. This should take about three minutes. Um, hopefully, it will take only three minutes, although 
Um, if we all click at the same time, it might take a little bit longer. Um, and then as soon as you click onto one of these, you'll either be able, if, if the cloud environment is ready, it will just open the editable view. If it's not quite ready, then you'll get this message um, that says creating cloud environment. You can navigate away and return in three to five minutes. So while we're doing that, I'll just take a quick look through the preview version of this notebook. So again, this is a preview mode. It's read only. Um, it is uh, clickable. So there, there are links here, for example, that you can click on. Um, and by the way, if you uh, still need the link for um, logging into Gen3 so that you can um, link your account, you would do that here. So for example, I would just click that. It's a live link you can see. Um, and so all of these cells that you can see at the top here, oh, there it is. So now you can actually see the separation between all of the different cells. So each one of these is a separate cell. You can tell right here what type of cell it is. So each one of these is actually a markdown cell. If I double click it, you can see the raw markdown format. And then if I press run, then it parses that markdown script. I could also change the code type here. So if I were to change this to code, it would then parse this in whatever type of uh, language kernel has been selected for this notebook. In this case, you can tell that it's an R kernel. So if I were to press if I were to press run right now, it wouldn't do much of anything because it interprets the, um, uh, uh, the hashtag here as a comment. Whereas in markdown, that represents a header level. So I'm going to press run. And by the way, uh, a, a shortcut that is very popular for running is to press shift return. Um, <clears throat> and um, so there are a bunch of very helpful uh, menus for doing things kind of quickly inside of a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, here, by the way, is what a code cell will actually look like. Uh, you'll notice uh, to the left of the code cell is an indicator of um, whether or not that cell has been run and how many times a cell has been run since the kernel uh, for the notebook has been restarted. So if I were to restart the kernel of this notebook over here using this restart button, then all of these numbers would disappear. And then I could run the notebook in whatever order I wanted. So if I were to restart the kernel and then decide that I wanted to run this cell uh, first, then this number would be replaced by a one. And likewise, I can just run that cell and that will actually take a minute or so. Um, and you can see on the left here, the fact that the cell is running is also indicated in this very helpful active table of contents. So this table of contents is clickable. I can go to any one of these sections by clicking on there. Um, and you can also tell whether or not a cell is running by whether or not it's highlighted. So there you can see that uh, uh, the uh, red highlighting disappeared, and indeed my code cell finished running. Um, and one thing that um, I'll also point out is that when you run one of these code cells, you'll notice this indicator over here um, will change. So when you're not running anything, then the kernel is idle. And when you are running something, then could see it was a very brief flash here. I'll do this one since it takes a little bit longer. <clears throat> so when that kernel is running, then it says the kernel is busy. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is click run all. And you'll see that the entire table of contents becomes highlighted. And so each one of these cells will now uh, run in order. And um, this notebook will uh, leave for uh, everyone here to 
uh, play around with. It's uh, useful um, for uh, basically moving around uh, data in uh, a um, JERS URI. Um, and it just contains uh, uh, all of the tools that you need to um, move DERS URI data. So you have uh, various types of uh, uh, copy and download commands. And one thing I should mention is these collapsible arrows. So we have uh, code folding automatically enabled in all of these notebooks. And um, so if you see um, any of these arrows uh, pointing uh, horizontally rather than vertically, then you know that there is some uh, hidden cells um, uh, uh, hidden by the code folding. So if you want to unfold any of those to see what's hidden there, you just click on the arrow and there you can see um, what the contents of the cell are and what the outputs are, if that cell is supposed to have any outputs. Um, and lastly, I'll point out that while a cell is running, the um, instead of a number, you'll see an asterisk. So uh, while the kernel is busy, then that number will be an asterisk. Once that cell finishes running, it will be replaced by a number. So there we've almost finished all of the cells. And there we go. So that's the very last cell running. And there it finishes. Um, and the last thing that uh, we'll show you is how to open a terminal. So it's very easy. You just use this terminal icon. When I do that, it opens this window for me. And here I now have a traditional terminal view looking directly at my virtual machine. And you can use um, the regular GSUtil and CP commands here just close out of that. And so other than that, I'll just point out that there are a few uh, useful uh, extra options in these menus um, that are provided in our instance of Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, one that I like in particular is the ability to uh, obviously run all of the cells in a notebook as soon as you open it, but also you can run all of the cells above or below whichever cell you have selected. So for example, if I were to change this one to a code cell and then select this one and then click run all above. So it would have run all of these cells. I'll do that again just so you can see that these cells above here were run. So run all above. So it runs these two cells as well as this one and it gives me an error because it's confused why why this is supposed to be our script when in reality it is not even close to being our script. So I can change it back to Markdown. There we go. And then click Run, and it compiles the way that it's supposed to. Um, there's also a way to insert cells wherever, wherever you are. So I can insert a cell above the one that I had selected. Um, <clears throat> and then um, I have uh, these options for how to control my kernels. So I can uh, do things like restart the kernel. I can restart the kernel and clear all of the outputs in case I don't want to see um, the old outputs. Um, or I have a, a nice fast way to restart the kernel and run the entire notebook all at once. And uh, this is also where uh, you can switch between the R and Python kernels. So if I were to switch, you can see over here, it takes a little bit of time, but then it says that this is now a Python kernel. Of course, a lot of this code will now not work, so we'll switch it back. And um, that's actually all we have for you here today. So I'll just show you that uh, I can then close out of this notebook. And um, in order to, so, Note that when you close the notebook, that does not mean that your cloud environment has stopped running. You can still see that it's running. It's giving you the real-time cost estimate right there. 
So uh, uh, we're running at about uh, 20 cents an hour. Um, if we want to not waste that money, we'll go ahead and press the pause button. Um, and it takes about a minute for it to spin down the cluster and then you're all done. So with that, I will open the floor up to uh, any questions about interactive analysis and then we can go on to a broader Q&A. This is John. I have maybe a trivial question, but something I'm a little bit confused about. So there's one persistent disk per environment. And if, if you, for instance, so you start out with a 50 gigabyte disk and you put on 40 gigabytes of data onto it, and then you spun up your environment again and tried to decrease the size of it. Are there any guardrails against that? Or would you potentially like delete half your data? If for instance, you moved from 50 gigabytes to uh, 25 gigabytes or something. I'm guessing uh, that if you recreate the persistent disk, it's not that it, it's not that it cuts out, it's that it recreates it from scratch. I every would, time, um, okay. I, if you specific, <clears throat> yes, if you, I think. Okay. Yes, correct us if correct us if we're wrong, but to I may, the parameter of the persistent disk, you know what is to replace it. Okay, so don't mess with it if you actually want persistence. Basically, you, yeah, uh, you're not trying you to can to. back up your files to your Google bucket, and then you can yeah. recreate your persistent disk and just bring them back in again. That's one option. Okay, so your bucket is persistent as yeah, well. Your, your okay. bucket, your bucket is, yeah, buckets. Bucket yeah. only goes away if you delete your workspace. Understood. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Are there any other questions? Feel free to speak up or post them in the chat. I'm sure you're going to cover this, but I did want to just point out that we do have that persistent disk tutorial in that workspace. It was right next to the um, other notebooks that you just saw on the screen there. Um, and so if you know I saw a lot of questions in the chat here relating to the persistent disks, so that might be a good thing to try yeah, I, I believe it's homework um, for this uh, workshop. So. I also wanted to say that um, you can increase the size of your persistent disk at any time. Um, that's totally fine. It'll keep all the files on it. If you decide to decrease the size, you'll actually get a warning in the UI saying that your data will be deleted. Um, so that's that's the guardrail that we do have in place. It'll It'll warn you about it. Gotcha. Thanks. That's kind of what I was fishing for. That makes sense. All right. Um, I'm going to throw it over to Ali real quick to show you some additional um, workflow things uh, now that we have a little bit of extra time here. Um, and then we'll come back for a, a wrap up and some more Q&A. So Ali, take it away. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to go through two things really quickly. The first thing I'd like to do um, is take you back to the data tab. And if you go to your the test sample that you ran, I'm, I'm hoping that your job finished. I know that mine did just as I was ending the um, the session, you know, you remember when you made it, you had two columns, there was the ID column and the cram column. Um, and once it finishes, you notice there's these two additional columns. Those are the ones that I wrote in that I added um, to the output. So there's an output cram index file right here. There's an output cram. If you hover over them, you can see the full path length, uh, length where they are. Um, it is quite long. So for example, if you went into files, um, and this is a little bit simpler because we only have the one, but if you imagine several workflow runs, each with its own, you know, non-human readable long name, and then um, it does have the, the workflow name, but here's another uh, long non-human readable, um, and uh, I'm not even sure which ones. All this is to say, you can you can understand why having the, the generated data written to the table makes it much easier to find and associate um, the data with it with um, with the proper person. Um, so I wanted to I want to mention that, and then I wanted to in the last few minutes run you through. Um, 
running the, uh, the same workflow on one CRAM file that you imported, because there are a, a couple of differences that I want to show you. Um, so if you look at your tables file, again, you have uh, about 15 tables that were imported from Gen 3, and the submitted aligned reads table is the one that includes that the CRAM files. So if, again, if you go to your workflows and select the same aligner, the same workflow, it's the only one you have in there. Uh, run workflows with inputs defined by the data table. This time we're going to use that submitted aligned reads table. So if you scroll down the submitted aligned reads so in step one, um, we do not want to run this on all, all the uh, samples because that would take a long time. This is not a down, down sampled version. So it actually will take about 24 hours to run this um, on one. So we don't want to process all rows. So you can choose specific rows. Um, I'm just going to show you on one, but I do want to show you if you were to choose two or a subset, um, Tara creates a, a, um, a new set for you. And that means, and you can name it whatever you want by filling in this, this field right here. And what that does for you is if you have a subset that you know you're going to run, um, like maybe you're testing on a subset, or maybe you have, um, you know, a certain subset of the entire table that corresponds to, I, I don't know, maybe you're going to run it on only the men or only, only women or something. Um, what creating a set allows you to do is the next time you don't have to go through and click um, to select the ones in your subset. You can just run on a set, which it can be very nice for scalability. So I'm going to run on these two, and I'm going to call it my, my uh, webinar test set. And click OK. And again, OK. So the input cram file is not this dot cram. So this is one of the slight differences. So our table was fairly simple. Um, we want, we do want to run from the, for the table, but you remember that um, I showed you that table had a lot of columns. So if you type this dot, again, it's going to give you all the columns. And you notice that, um, remember the PFB namespace, that that is re required to be in, um, in here. So after this dot, it's exactly what's in the column header. So if you scroll down, there's a lot of different, uh, a lot of different variables. I happen to know that the right column for the cram file is PFB um, colon GA4 GH underscore DURS underscore URI. If you weren't sure which was the column, you could go back to your data tab table and scroll through and look. Um, before before setting up this piece. So again, um, just if you start typing this dot, it will give you all the columns in the table. You need to pick the right one that corresponds to the variable and save it. And I'm going to use the same output names. Um, can you take a guess where is, is this going to output, is this going to make columns in that test sample data file or where do you, where are the where are the columns that I've defined here in the outputs um, tab going to going to show up in the uh, submitted aligned reads or I forget what the exactly the exactly so in this root and so Whatever you output, when you type this dot, it's going to go to this, what, whatever you, is the root entity type in step one. The nice thing about it, about the way this is set up, is that means the, the outputs will be in the same table that the Whittle goes to for your inputs. So it's, it's just a, a way to keep track of things. And then if you click on Run Analysis again, and you launch, 
And remember, I, I did, I had two files that I selected. If I had 50, I would have 50 um, rows here. Each of these is a submitted a submission. So it's running the, the workflow twice in parallel on these two different um, samples. And they probably won't finish at the same time. They, it, they just get submitted to the cloud and they finish when they finish. So I just wanted to run that by people and then give some, give some time at the end for questions. And I'm going to stop sharing. Great. Thank you, Ali. Um, Anton, would you take us through some closing remarks and then we'll open up for general Q&A? Absolutely. Thanks, Ali and Kate. Um, so <clears throat> we'll just uh, close up by saying thank you so much for joining us. Um, I want to uh, make sure that everybody here knows where they can find all of the materials for both this webinar and the follow-up webinar. Um, you can go to this um, link, which is a um, Google Drive that we've set up for um, all of the materials. Um, Kate just shared the link in the chat. And in here, you can find the syllabus to um, all of the uh, materials. So you can find the materials themselves, all of the slides with um, the links in these two subfolders. Um, and then if you want to uh, take a look at the syllabus itself, um, that's separate. Um, and so we, um, we finished our uh, webinar one agenda. And one thing that we want to point out is that we have some suggested additional practice uh, after webinar one, as well as um, some webinar two pre-work that we recommend doing um, in advance of uh, the next webinar. So uh, we suggest that you uh, complete this uh, notebooks quick start workspace tutorial um, <clears throat> as well as um, this uh, uh, persistent disk exercises exercise and we have a link to our uh, blog as well um, and then Ali I don't know if you want to add anything about um, uh, uh, additional ways of running any part of the tutorial that uh, you just did no, I think we're good. I think um, it doesn't, it's not a terribly, it's not an ex expensive to run um, the aligner on one or even two samples. It does, it will take about a day, um, but it's, it's worth doing just to see kind of how things um, look and how they interact. Um, that's all I would, I would say. Yeah. Fabulous. And then uh, the last but not least thing is we hope everyone will um, complete this survey that's uh, very useful and important to us. So um, going to, unless someone else already shared it. Oh, yes, Kate already shared it. So if you will kindly complete the survey, we would very much appreciate it. And uh, with that, we thank you and we'll take any remaining questions that you have.